Hello, welcome back to this continued discussion on uh, Kamala Das. No wonder, you know, having heard uh, some of her lines, having heard about her, you know, no wonder if you feel that, you know, uh, you are in the presence of uh, some live fire. It is true that, you know, there is a kind of a, a burning, uh, if you hold her poetry, you get burnt in that, of course, burnt in a positive sense. Earlier too, we had used this metaphor, please recall poetry has the capacity to burn us and fashion us afresh. So, in that sense, you know, we can call every reader of poetry, every reader of literature is a dvija. Of course, Indian philosophical traditions are in caste system, dvija has a different connotation. Dvija is a twice born, when somebody wears the sacred thread, it is said they become, you know, they are, they are born again. Well, uh, that is a metaphoric meaning. Well, poetry too has the capacity to, you know, make us, you know, uh, you know to, to burn us, to burn our older self and create us afresh. Therefore, you know, even poetry makes us dvijas, the twice born. So, every reader of poetry is twice born in that sense. We were discussing in the last class how Kamala Das poetry can be called, you know, confessional poetry and how, of course, keeping, uh, you know, looking at the spirit of confession, she almost practiced it to perfection. Therefore, you cannot find uh, a better confessional poet or more, uh, you know, uh, honest uh, and confessional, you know, poet than Kamala Das. We were discussing all that. Let us continue our discussion of her poetry, okay. Uh, it was true that, uh, you know, the time in which she wrote uh, or the period in which she lived, uh, you know, she always felt, uh, you know, trapped in that because she was always ahead of her time or unfortunately, uh, the society in which she lived failed to keep up with her pace. That is why she always felt, you know, a bit trapped in a kind of an, a society that she felt was, you know, uh, uh, it did not do justice to her, that is how she felt and of course, she has every reason to feel that way. In the highest sense of the term, she was a true seeker, she was a seeker of freedom and poetry for her was a means to achieve that freedom. That is why of course, uh, you know, words gave her a new set of wings what she could not achieve in life, she achieved it through her imagination, through her writing. So, therefore, you can say that uh, it was poetry that helped her, that really helped her to come out of the shackles of society and liberated her, you know. She felt truly liberated in the imaginative spaces of poetry and literature. Uh, yeah, uh, we discussed this that, uh, you know, as a major confession, of course, she, it is not that she branded herself as a confession poet, but we consider her as a, a confession poet because, of course, you know, she uh, chose poetry as a medium to convey her deepest secrets or wildest thoughts. and even, you know, suppressed desires. That is the reason why we said that poetry for her was more a liberating uh, uh, force and uh, she chose to pour her heart out, you know, words absorbed, what society could not take, words absorbed, you know, she, words gave her, you know, good companionship, you know, that is the reason why uh, she emerged as uh, the greatest uh, poet because, you know, because of her extraordinary poetic sensibility and attachment to confessional mode. She is generally compared to, compared with, uh, you know, poets such as Sylvia Plath and of course, her poetic genius is no less than that of Sylvia Plath or probably a little more than what uh, Sylvia Plath did. She is, uh, you know, much greater than Sylvia Plath, of course. Having heard about her uh, uh, life, having heard about her views and poetry 
and having uh, heard some snippets of her poems here and there you know now let's come face to face with one of her most uh, uh, well known uh, poems you know again you can see the autobiographical elements in this poem and confessional uh, mode of poetry that she practiced in that poem so this poem epitomizes uh, her both preoccupations you know the autobiographical preoccupation and how poetry becomes a, a mode through which you write your story you know you write your story and how poetry offers you a space you know to to share your deepest uh, desires darkest thoughts and things like that of course it's a slightly longish poem so we have uh, you know again taken a few excerpts we have left out a few stanzas retained some and uh, if she interests you you should seek out her poetry and read rest of her poetry as well including this poem i don't know politics but i do i don't know politics but i know the names of those in power and can repeat them like days of weeks or names of months beginning with nehru right in the very first few lines she makes her disdain for politics explicit right it's not i mean she is well versed not with politics she can like a child that learns to memorize she knows you know the leaders those in power those leaders you know she can repeat them that does not mean she is attached to them like a child is made to memorize nothing beyond that you know nothing beyond that so right there her disdain for you know politics is quite evident i am indian very brown born in malabar i speak three languages right in two dream in one of course when we read uh, poems like this of course the entire uh, you know this activity is to help us read a poem you know uh, please do not because we are discussing you know poetry from uh, across the globe you know please don't mistake this course as a kind of a, a course that gives you an historical overview no of course the one of the ideas behind uh, all these classes is to give you an overview of uh, poetry but when we go deeper into at least a few poems the intention is to make you familiar with how you know poetry works you know how poetry through words uh, you know weaves uh, a different magic into the uh, fabric of language you know poetry you know unfolds using the fabric of magic but it's not just the fab um, fabric of language but it's not just the fabric of language that's there in poetry a great poet a great writer weaves many other things you know many other things including you know slicing a part of uh, their own life slicing a part of their own flesh their own soul they weave it into the fabric of uh, language and thereby you know make language immortal as well okay i speak three languages write in two dream in one don't write in english they said english is not your mother tongue they stand for you know it stands for critics or those who try to critique her choices her the choice of a language what she wrote you know they went on prescribing what she should write in which language she should write and all that so this is a kind of a response to all that you know response to all that so you can go on identifying different literary elements here and you can also go on uh, learning or go on reading with me uh, these poems and in the process pick up uh, you know how to read poetry in general because you know most of us feel uh, difficulty you know we find uh, poetry very difficult to understand not because it uses extraordinary language or words that uh, you and i don't know but because we don't know how to read it you know we don't know how to read it so if we learn to read it properly then probably you find poetry uh, easiest you know you find uh, you know poetry very easy to go by and more than that please remember 
poetry of course only one dimension of poetry is meaning there is another dimension right in the very first class we identify we identified poetry are having two dimensions one is the dimension of sound the other is the dimension of sense you know so you must also focus in your eagerness to search for meaning in poetry or meaning in your eagerness to uh, search for meaning in poems that you read you should not lose sight of uh, you know the sound or how you know uh, poetry constructs an image so if you are uh, you know if you are used to drawing you know using uh, you know pencil sketches or watercolors or even uh, oil colors remember poetry is just that you know it's like uh, painting the canvas with words that's all painting the canvas with words therefore when you create a, a you know when you create a, a drawing what do you look for when you create a drawing or when you create a painting what do you look for in that in fact it pleases your eyes it fills your entire being you know it gives you a, an ex, a, an extraordinary sense of fulfillment a rare sense of satisfaction that's all right you don't look for meaning in painting though it is quite possible to look for meaning it's not the be all and the end all so is poetry right uh, so that's why you you i mean you there is a poet who says a poem does not mean it just be you know it exists that's all it is not there to mean something it it just exists you know so please focus on this aspect of poetry as well please focus on this aspect you know once when you realize that you know you know using words a poem just creates some kind of a picture then of course you understand uh, you know because you know that's when you you derive a sense of fulfillment yeah so as respond i mean in uh, while responding to this kind of criticism she says why not leave me alone critics friends visiting cousins every one of you why not let me speak in any language i like why don't you i mean why do you keep interfering in everything because basically poetry is where a soul speaks with itself or where a self speaks with its own soul therefore it is the most intimate moment so during your most intimate moments you do not want anybody coming and giving you instructions right you don't like that because it's your moment it's your private moment so therefore she says you know why don't you leave me let me be let me write in whatever language i like why do you keep advising the language i speak becomes mine its distortions its queerness all mine mine alone how else do you own anything when you use a language it becomes yours right and as long as it's yours as long as it expresses what you wish to express why do you care in which language you i mean you write as long as the language that you use is capable of uh, you know uh, giving voice to your innermost feelings your innermost uh, you know uh, emotions that is sufficient you should not care what i mean what is the figure of speech involved what is the language in which you are writing as long as you find the language you write is capable of conveying what you wish to convey then there ends the matter all debates are closed well if somebody criticizes that her english is uh, not really english it's uh, half english it's indian english well of course so i mean how does it matter it's half english half indian funny perhaps but it's honest it's as human as i am human don't you see that right like you don't find a perfect human be being you don't find a perfect language for poetry we have to do with whatever we have got right therefore if it's half english so be it how does it matter because it's capable of conveying what i wish to convey it voices my joys my longings my hopes and it is useful to me as cawing is to crows or roaring to the lions look how natural see speaking in english for me is as it comes as natural to me as cawing is to crow and roaring to the lions 
you may not like the voice of a crow, but just because you don't like a crow does not change the way it cause, right? That is its voice whether you like it or not is immaterial to that. So, is it with me you know I do not care whether you approve of my writing in English, my writing in Malayalam, my writing in any other language as long as it is mine therefore, I write in it. If you like you read it, if you do not like it you do not need to you know read it as simple as that. It is human speech the speech of the mind that is here and not here a mind that sees and hears and is aware. Anywhere and everywhere I see the one who calls himself I in this world he is tightly packed like the sword in a sheath. It is I who drink lonely drinks at 12 midnight in hotels of strange towns. It is I who laugh, it is I who make love and then feel shame. It is I who lie dying with a rattle in my throat. I am sinner, I am saint, I am the beloved and the betrayed. I have no joys that are not yours, no aches which are not yours. I too call myself I. You know, this is where poetry achieves its universality you know cutting down on the differences the external differences you know it makes us realize how we are all connected at the core how each of us is connected. Of course, if you can recall what Dunn said in 17th century no man is an island when he says man of course human beings no being is an island everyone's death diminishes me he says because you know why should anyone's death diminish us? Because we are all connected at the end of the day you know there is a reason why all human beings are here and there is a mysterious thread that binds us you know the day we realize or the day the day we see that mysterious thread that connects all of us then our approach towards life is different becomes different then the way we treat people around us becomes different we become evolved creating I mean evolved creatures. Uh, such philosophical depth conveyed using the simplest of language in such an extraordinary confessional mode. This is Kamala Das for us and that is why she becomes important for us you know. Well of course, uh, uh, many awards went in search of her, but uh, we should realize that it is not the awards that determine the quality of the poet. Nevertheless, of course, just to make us familiar make ourselves familiar with the kind of award she won these are some of the significant awards. She won the Kerala Sahitya Academy Award, Asian Poetry Prize, PEN it is a very prestigious uh, you know award you know. She was shortlisted for Nobel Prize in Literature in 1984 and in 85 the very next year she won the Kendra Central Sahitya Academy Award and uh, you know many other awards she was even uh, honored with the Asian poetry prize and she was bestowed uh, with an honorary dealing degree and all that you know and the Kerala gov government honored her with the uh, Ejitachan award you know the highest literary award that one can get for her contribution to Malayalam literature you know these are uh, some of her important works and uh, Considering her contribution to uh, poetry and Indian literature scene, this is how you know various uh, uh, newspapers, journals, and literary ventures chose to you know commemorate, you know, paid their tribute uh, when she passed away. You know, so this is Kamala Das for us. You know, so if you know this class uh, piques your interest in her poetry or if this has even made you curious about her poetry then of course, the purpose of the class is uh, half done because we wish to create you know our intention is not to give you an exhaustive account of any of these writers when we discuss them. On the other hand to pique your interest in them because you know this right it is a very short course. Uh, in this short, short course we may not even be able to do justice to a single writer forget you know the gamut of writers we have discussed we may not even be able to do justice to a single writer. The purpose of the class let me reiterate this is to pique your interest in 
all these writers so that you know if there is any writer you find some kind of connection with you can go back and you know connect yourself with their writing you know having discussed kamala das let's move on to another fellow poet or uh, in a sense uh, uh, a precursor to kamala das's poetry in fact many have identified uh, eunice de souza as a kind of you know forerunner to the kind of confessional poetry that kamala das practiced another well known fellow writer and uh, you know somebody who changed uh, the literary landscape not just of goa you know but of the entire uh, literary scene of india so very briefly of course she was uh, you know an english poet novelist professor of literature a literary critic and uh, editor of some important volumes and she has also authored a couple of children's works as well you know Uh, so this is uh, Eunice de Souza, another major poet. Uh, uh, of course, there is no point calling these writers as uh, Indian English uh, women poets and all that. They are Indian English poets, you know. Of course, we can even call them uh, do away with Indian English and all that, just poets. But of course, uh, we use Indian English as a special signifier for something which we discussed in the beginning of uh, you know this week. Uh, yeah very quickly this is her uh, uh contribution to literature she has uh, you know a couple of poetry collections to her credit beginning with the fix which is her first poetry collection that came out in 1979 followed by you know women in dutch painting 1988 ways of belonging a necklace of skulls is uh, you know a remarkable uh, poetry collection that won her several accolades and uh, uh, learn from the almond leaf that's her last collection more than uh, you know her collections uh, she is also well known for her uh, edited volumes you know because they change the landscape of uh, indian english uh, poetry in a significant way therefore her contribution is also in this way uh early indian english poetry indian poetry in english an anthology uh satyanathan family album these my words penguin book of indian poetry folk tales from india parda an anthology nine indian women poets an anthology you know they drew the attention of the readers towards uh, fellow poets and you know and and created interest uh, in their writing as well and she has also uh, a couple of novels to her credit this is her writing so very naturally because of her contribution she was uh, praised by her uh, colleagues jerry pinto ranjit oskote who who is himself a, a, an extraordinary poet a successor of uh, her poetry you can say in fact uh, ranjit oskote's poetry is uh, deeply influenced by the poetry of uh, unis de souza so therefore he pays a rich tribute to her and uh, adil chisawala a fellow poet uh, you know uh, technically speaking uh, she too belonged to the bombay circle initially she spent much of her time in uh, in the company of adil chisawala arvind krishna marhotra and others and uh, you know there are many uh, critics who find uh, a lineage of uh, 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 nizam as skills uh, poetry you know in uh, unis de souza's poetry uh, of course they were contemporaries they were uh, she was influenced by his writing and all that uh, and again uh, if we can briefly evoke uh, uh, her uh, the essence of her poetry she used uh, she is considered a minimalist with words you know um, you can recall uh, Uh, minimalism you know uh, using you know economy of expression becomes again important here using the minimum number of words or you know not decorative not embellishing it with here and there but achieving the extraordinary effect that you wish to achieve you know using simplest of the words so her poetry achieves that kind of a uh, feat you know so with a, a tint of stoicism and uh, irony she put forth through her writing uh, 
uh, hypocrisies, especially of the Goan Catholic community, uh, the community to which she belonged to. Uh, therefore, her poetry had the capacity through satire, through irony, she helped expose the hypocrisy of Indian society in general. And see, one of the reasons why poets do this or writers do it is not to lampoon. Of course, it is true that uh, one of the objectives of uh, a satire, a literary satire is to expose the follies and foibles of a society. But behind that is an extraordinary hope that when exposed, you know, it is like a wound. So, unless you expose it to uh, medicine, a, a wound does not heal on its own. So, a literary exposure of a society's hypocrisy has the capacity to heal the society of its own wounds. So, her poetry does that job. So, when somebody asked uh, to comment on her own poetry or to, to you know to briefly describe her own poems, this is how she chose to call you know she said my poems are these are lyrical poems with soft sensuous and passionate lines you know that's how she chose to describe her own poetry uh, well in the context of kamala das we discussed how we can uh, consider her as a preeminent confessional poet that's true for uh, eunice de souza as well in fact more than confession confessional uh, poetry, she inaugurates uh, you know a kind of uh, uh, what you can call autobiographical poetry you know. Though of course, she went on saying how do not look for my life in these poems, she went on saying that that is also the title of her uh, poem, it is a short poem where she says poems have order, sanity, aesthetic distance from debris, whereas life does not have all that you know life you cannot say there is order in life, there is sanity in life, it is on the edge, our life is in the edge, you know. Uh, so, therefore, she went on saying that nevertheless, it is true that her poetic works are filled with uh, her autobiographical details, her experiences, her uh, you know again her frustrations, her hopes and anxieties find a better match in words. Therefore, uh, she can be rightly called autobiographical poet you know. Yeah. So, commenting again on her own first uh, collection of uh, poems which we have identified as fix and uh, you know she says that you know it is a slow burning fuse about my own community. She went on writing this precisely what um, writers do you know bringing in uh, because they, they have a first hand knowledge about the society you know they use that society as uh, you know uh, a creative cornucopia and uh, uh, you know they are born out of the society and of course, when they are not happy with certain aspects of society, they critique it and they want that society. So, that you know the society can overcome and uh, be a kind of a hospitable uh, place for everybody to live in a harmonious and a peaceful way. As we have already uh, discussed, her contribution is not just to uh, Indian English poetry. Uh, through her uh, poetry collections, uh, she has a significant uh, edited volumes. Through that, she helped her fellow poets, uh, you know, find their uh, rightful name and fame in Indian English poetry as well. You know, that's why one of her fellow poets, Jerry Pinto says that she put together some of the most important anthologies to have been published in the last 20 years. So, if you want to have, if you want to get a, a picture of uh, you know some major Indian English poets, Indian English women poets especially, if you look at some of her anthologies, you will find you know a better representation of that particular literary scene. So, therefore, her contribution is there as well. A Necklace of Skulls is her extraordinary collection. Again, uh, not it is not a very voluminous piece, you know, uh, about 70 odd poems divided into 7 odd subsections. Through them, she explores human life using an extraordinary skill and, uh, you know, uh, language. Again, Skulls, of course, is symptomatic and it 
acts as synecdoche, we have discussed synecdoche and uh, they feature her poetic works especially even some of her older poems that did not uh, that were not published earlier uh, are included in a necklace of skulls and a very important collection by the poet. Before we end uh, uh, discussing uh, Eunice de Souza, here is uh, a poem of course, as we said you know please think of uh, minimalism look what she achieves using uh, the economy of expression look what she achieves here. Marriages are made of course, there is a popular statement right marriages are made in heaven she deliberately does not use the word the next part of that phrase in heaven marriages are made. Now, look how marriages are made of course, it is a, a powerful critique of patriarchal society because if you look for any matrimonial uh, I mean you know ads you will see uh, the hypocrisy of uh, you know patriarchy how they describe as if you know uh, as if uh, you know brides are are available in market they, they describe you know fair handsome good looking somebody docile. So, her look look how she critiques uh, this kind of mindset marriages are made. My cousin Elena is to be married the formalities have been completed her family history examined for TB and madness her father declared solvent her eyes examined for squints her teeth for cavities her stools for the possible non Brahmin worm. She is not quite tall enough and not quite full enough of course, children will take care of that. So, therefore, nothing to worry I mean this is how you know when when a boys family is about to search for a girl probably is not the mindset in which we work you know in which we live even now. Her complexion it was decided would compensate being just about the right shade of rightness to do justice to Francisco Norana Prabhu good son of mother church. Now, look at how you know what is remarkable is you know the choice of simple words not even complex structures, but powerful enough to expose the hypocrisy of a patriarchal society in its uh, search for it that is why this is another one I mean her well known poem advice to women especially you know here the poetic persona speaks uh, offers advice to women you know in case if they wish not to feel uh, cheated in relationships uh, what they can do keep cats if you want to learn to cope with the otherness of lovers you know here cats become metaphors too you know if you want to learn you know to cope with uh, uh, you know betrayals in life uh, you need to keep cats why because otherness is not always neglect cats return to their litter trays when they need to. Similarly, you know men get back whenever they need women they get back you know, but of course, not very overt it is not said overtly a uh, sensible reader would be able to make uh, the implied meaning here. Do not cuss out of the window at their enemies the stare of perpetual surprise in those great green eyes will teach you to die alone. So, borrowing on uh, the cats uh, impersonal it is said right that cats do not get attached to people they get attached to houses that is a known saying. So, I mean borrowing on that she says if you want to get used to being aloof in relationships how women though are a part of uh, a relationship how they have to how they silently bear the brunt of uh, uh, being alone how they are not considered their feelings are not considered and all that advice to women. All right, uh, I am sure uh, you have enjoyed uh, listening to uh, these classes let us quickly recall what we did uh, in the earlier class we began with the poetry of Kamala Das and we continued that in this class as well and we discussed uh, Kamala Das poetry as uh, you know confessional poetry and then we moved on to Eunice de Souza and how we can see in her poetry uh, expression of her own self and we also read some of her interesting poems. Again if uh, these classes have helped you to uh, 
uh, you know uh, develop your interest in poetry in general and poetry of these two remarkable poets then of course it's a remarkable feat uh, we'll see you in the next class with uh, some more fellow indian english poets thank you take care